Our first speaker, so to speak, is, is Bill Hayton, uh, who's the editor of uh, Asian Affairs, that journal that you've all picked up copies of on your way in and won't, hopefully won't leave on the train, <clears throat> but will read enthusiastically. Uh, Bill's an associate fellow at the at Chatham House on the Asia Pacific program, and he was a BBC reporter in Vietnam, Myanmar, and various other hot spots, and has written four books on <coughs> Southeastern Asia. And he's going to talk to us about the South China Seas. Bill, thank you very Great. much. Thank you very much indeed. Yep. So as Adrian was saying, I edit this after 22 years at the BBC. Um, I left about three years ago. Um, I'm afraid I didn't learn a language at university. I studied geography. Um, uh, my interests uh, around the time led me into the Middle East. I didn't then try to pick up a bit of Arabic. Um, I went to um, the West Bank in the summer of 1998, thinking this would be the moment to kickstart my journalistic career, and it turned out to be the dullest summer since the Balfour Declaration. Nothing happened. But I ended up getting a job at the BBC um, anyway, a bit later on. Um, and But then uh, a little later after that, I went to Vietnam, uh, lived there, spent a year reporting for the BBC, um, and wrote a book about Vietnam, which then a, f a little bit later, I then took an interest in what was happening offshore Vietnam, the South China Sea. Um, and uh, I've written a book since called The Invention of China about um, the, the birth of Chinese nationalism. So all of these things are sort of connected in my mind, thinking about uh, nations and nationalism um, and how ideas about territorial claims uh, come to uh, exist and, and why they remain uh, problems for our current world. So this picture was taken uh, in August, um, and it's a picture taken from a Philippine boat uh, ship that was trying to reach uh, a little outpost that the Philippines hold in the South China Sea. And you see the Chinese Coast Guard are using water cannon to, um, to try and stop them from doing so. <clears throat> but that's at one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, these are pictures taken from American surveillance planes over the South China Sea. This one, 2018. And here you can see a Chinese warship trying to cut in front of an American warship. Uh, this is a picture taken from a B-52 bomber with a Chinese fighter jet um, flying uncomfortably close. Um, and so what's what's going on? Why is all this happening? Um, so this is the South China Sea. Um, so China at the top, Vietnam here, um, Malaysia down the bottom, but Brunei, Indonesian islands here, and then the Philippines here. So the South China Sea is a bit in the middle. Um, and the world's most pathetic territorial dispute um, features uh, these little tiny rocks and reefs. Um, this is the mainly contested area called the Spratleys, named after a man called Richard Spratley, who came from the east end of London and became a shipping captain, um, Palisal Islands, um, and Scarborough Shoal. Um, and this is what all the arguments are about, okay? These are the largest of the South China Sea Islands, okay? They are pathetically small, okay? Not even long enough to get uh, a runway on in most cases. That's the largest one there, which is occupied by Taiwan. Um, Vietnamese hold that one, Chinese hold that one. That's the largest one held by the Philippines. Um, these are some of the smallest, okay? So it is somewhat of a tragic part of world politics that literally the Third World War could break out over this, yeah? Because this involves the US and the Philippines, which are treaty allies of one another. Um, if the Chinese were to attack a Philippine ship in some confrontation around the Scarborough Shoal, the United States could choose to intervene on the side of the Philippines. And who knows, maybe you'd end up with some kind of clash between the US and China, and who knows where that would go. Uh, China occupied a couple of these features, uh, six or seven of them back in 1988, and then Another one in uh, in 1994. Uh, this one was occupied by Malaysia, and Malaysians were the first to build a, a runway on it. But you can see how tiny, small they are. Um, but have a look at the, remember what those two look like on the on the right hand side there. Those Chinese held ones. This is what they look like now. Okay. So that little blockhouse you see is that building there, and the other one I think is that building there. In since 2013, over the past 10 years. China has built these are 3,000 meter runways, three kilometers long, these runways, um, on all of them. And then there are 
four items with the smaller health features. Absolutely massive um, features, uh, you know, with running tracks, with barracks, with um, missile silos, and all the rest of it. Um, on things which are basically tiny, tiny, tiny little islands. So why, why do they care? Why do they bother? What's the purpose of spending literally billions of dollars building this stuff? Um, it kind of seems absurd. Uh, anybody recognize this bit of sea? No? No. Um, this, bizarrely, is the southernmost point of Chinese territory. <clears throat> and the most important thing to know about it is that there's no territory there. Yeah? China has a claim to territory that doesn't actually exist. Okay, and um, this piece of sea is down here. Okay, off the coast of Malaysian Borneo. It's a very long way from China. So how is it that China claims this non-existent island as the southernmost point of its territory? It's mainly the fault of this man, a geographer called Bai Mei Chu, who in 1936 drew a map. Now this is all about the emergence of a sense of Chinese nationalism and uh, China's clashes with Japanese and French expansionism. France at this time is the imperial power in Indochina. Uh, Britain is the imperial power in Singapore and uh, in Borneo down here. Uh, the US is the imperial power in the Philippines over here. So it's at a time when China is very, the China, emergence of Chinese nationalism, very powerful force. And people like Bai Li Chu are desperately trying to define the extent of Chinese territory um, and to defend it rhetorically and in print um, against foreign powers. So he draws a, a map from Atlas and he decides that these features here are should be Chinese held islands. He has no knowledge of the South China Sea, he's never been there. Okay, but then he draws this line around these features, and none of these features actually exist. They're, none of them are actual islands, they are all underwater features. Um, and the name as I'll show, our translations. So he gives us the name Heimatan, which Heimer is literally the translation of the word seahorse in English. Um, Chanwei is literally the translation of the word vanguard. Zengmu is the transliteration of the English name James. So why does he do that? It's because he copied a British map. Okay, this map was produced in London in 1918, and you'll see Vanguard Bank, James Shaw, Seahorse Bank. Okay. And you'll see the dotted lines that he draws around that the person in Stanford who put up his map around there. Now, by Mei Chu, Chinese geographer, misunderstood these dotted lines. <clears throat> they just mean a shallow area of sea. But Chang, but uh, Bai Mei Chu thought, oh, these must be islands. And so he coloured them in and claimed them as territory. And then drew his line around them. And then a few years later, at the end of the Second World War, a couple of his students were advising the Chinese government about what land should be claimed after the defeat of Japan, the end of the Second World War, and they borrowed their geography professor's map with the same names, Zeng Wutan down here, Chan Wei Tan over here, Hang Wutan, and they drew this dotted line around the South China Sea and claimed a non-existent island here as Chinese territory. And unfortunately, and that claim is still with us today. And that is the root of these clashes in the South China Sea, which could one day lead to the Third World War. And this line continues to animate, motivate Chinese policy today. So here I've taken a map and I've projected these clashes on this line. Um, and this is where we've been, we've been seeing clashes recently between Chinese vessels and once I've heard uh, Vietnamese vessels, uh, Philippine vessels, and occasionally Indonesian and, and Malaysian ships as well. And this line seems to be treated from the Chinese side as some kind of border. Now, it's important when you want to think about the South China Sea that there are actually two sets of disputes. There are territorial disputes, which is who owns the rocks and the reefs? Who first stuck their flag in it? Who says they you know, claimed it and has the longest history of occupation? Okay, and that just involves the countries that I talked about China, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, um, Brunei. Um, and there's another set of disputes which we call maritime disputes, which are about the spaces in between the rocks and reefs. What are the rules that apply? Who can catch the fish? Who can drill the oil and gas? 
uh, who can sail there, who can stop them sailing there. And that involves the states around the sea, but also involves countries that care about the rules that govern the world. So the US, the UK, Japan, Australia um, are also engaged in thinking about what we call the rules-based order. Yeah, And the key rule, if you like, that affects the South China Sea um, is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, um, which was agreed by pretty much every country in the world back in 1982, um, and it's supposed to set the rules for who can claim the oil and the gas and the fish and everything else that lives in the sea um, uh, up to 200 nautical miles, 400 kilometers away from their coasts. So these rules, in theory, are agreed by everybody um, and should indicate, uh, you know, what is right and wrong in the South China Sea. Unfortunately, China doesn't accept, though that's the final say uh, when it comes to the South China Sea. And that's the, the root of uh, a lot of these issues. And that's because these tiny little islands exist. If these islands didn't exist, like for example, the North Sea, it would be fairly easy for these states to simply draw lines in the sea and say, okay, all the oil and gas over the fish over here belong to us, on, on this side belong to you. But because these islands, pathetically small as they are, exist, it complicates things. Well, let's look at it from the Chinese perspective. Why does China care about the South China Sea? So you turn the map upside down, put China at the bottom, and then you realize that the forces of plate tectonics, if you remember your geography lessons, uh, have created a whole series of islands around the South China Sea, starting from Japan here, through the Ryukyu Islands to Taiwan to the Philippines, uh, in the Mount of Brunei and up there. So, in effect, China is surrounded from the sea by these little islands. Um, and the forces of geopolitics mean that all of these islands are controlled by uh, countries which are in some kind of military relationship with the United States. So, Japan is a treaty ally of the US, the Philippines is a treaty ally of the US. Taiwan has his strange status, which we can talk about, but he's basically you know, a treaty ally of the US. Um, and then you've got Malaysia and Indonesia, which have close defense relations. So there's this sense of um, Chinese theorists about being encircled from the sea. And then when you think about where China gets its oil and gas from, uh, although it does have some uh, homegrown stuff, you know, anything coming from the Middle East has to go through the Straits of Malacca or one of the other straits down here through the South China Sea. Um, and China doesn't trust the rules of the world to permit free navigation. Uh, it seems to have an idea of the world that's one where it's, if, if states need to control um, their sea lanes and their supply routes, which is why um, you know, China has built a new base in Djibouti over here, has a close relationship with Pakistan, um, was uh, also involved in building bases in, in uh, a naval port in uh, Sri Lanka as well. So this is the sort of world I think that sort of Chinese strategists start to think about when they think about the South China Sea. Um, this guy was one of the sort of architects of the Chinese Navy. Uh, he was a you know, big thinker about why China needed the Navy. And really his, his main issues were about territory, about trying to get Taiwan back, um, about trying to recover islands uh, that we talk about, the disputed islands, so Spratlys and the Paracels, and maritime resources, oil and gas, and that kind of thing. Um, and this has been a long case of China's assertiveness becoming greater as its naval capabilities um, have increased. So now, in their aircraft carriers and nuclear power submarines, um, you'll see much more um, assertiveness uh, year on year um, from here. Final element of the Chinese thinking is the idea that they could turn the South China Sea into what Sabanians call a bastion, so that they would have island bases here and here, and potentially on Scarborough Shoal here, and they keep out all the other navies and they can hide their ballistic missile submarines there. Um, and the submarines are in effect the last line of defense for the Chinese Communist Party leadership. Also thinking about it in terms of uh, if ever China decided to invade Taiwan, which you know is on the cards, uh, then having bases down here in the south part of the South China Sea would prevent American warships or other countries coming to the defense of Taiwan. So these are all kind of part of the 
Chinese thinking, but there is no official explanation for the Chinese claim. Uh, Chinese officials are always very vague. Uh, they talk about, well, this is an academic, not an official, sovereignty over the features, on class the law of the sea that I was talking about, and then this vague thing called historic rights, which they're very uh, bad at telling us what it actually means. Um, but it seems to affect things like oil and gas and, um, and who has the right to sail wherever. Uh, this man, so I suppose you spoke about Bai Mei Chu as the geographer who created the non-existent, the claim to the non-existent islands. This man was a Taiwanese academic who invented this idea of historic rights. So um, he's caused, in some ways I think this man should have the anti-Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, he's done more probably to disrupt peace in the South China Sea than, than any other individual, I would think. Um, in response to you know, some of the pushback, China has uh, developed alternative legal explanations as to why it should hang on to the South China Sea and, and the oil and gas and resources. This is sometimes called lawfare, the idea that you use law as an extension of you know, your state um, maneuvering. So rather than going to war, you use law. These uh, advanced legal explanations, which other lawyers don't accept. So this is when we start to get into the um, idea of you know, whose rules rule in the world. Why should you accept uh, UN uh, uh, convention law, why should you accept um, or should you be allowed to innovate yourself and, and assert your own claims? The implications that this has for other countries in the region can be seen from uh, what's going on in the southern part of the South China Sea. So this is the, the nine dash line that I talked about, um, you know, back to 1947. Uh, Indonesia has an island here, which and under UNCLOS, it has the rights to the resources in this part of the sea up to 200 nautical miles from its nearest piece of land. But there is an overlap here. So in this zone, uh, we see clashes between Indonesia uh, and Vietnamese uh, and, and Chinese fish, uh, Chinese uh, coast guards. There's a massive natural gas field here, which Vietnam wants to exploit. Um, because Vietnam is suffering from a crisis of electricity and it's affecting its economic growth, the Chinese are trying to stop it. Um, you can see how they've used Coast Guard ships to try and patrol in the region uh, since, um, since this deal was announced. Malaysia also has the same problems um, around some of its oil and gas fields. Um, China often talks about joint development, but the Vietnamese and everybody else are very suspicious about it. They've been talking about this block for 20 years. Um, and basically the, the Vietnamese want to drag this line longer and the Chinese want to make this joint development zone wider. And so for 20 years, they've been sitting in a room saying longer, wider, longer, wider, and not getting anywhere at all. Um, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and China have been talking about having a code of conduct to regulate how their navies and coast guards behave. They've been talking about it for 25 years. Got nowhere. The same issues keep coming up and back. Um, but there's still all sides, at least rhetorically, are still talking about abiding by international law. Um, the rules are still holding, if you like, in the South China Sea. And more states are taking an interest in what's going on there. And this, for the time being, a kind of uneasy compromise exists. So we're not really, uh, you know, at the point where people are talking about a height, you know, about you know, a real war, but there's always the chance that some tiny incident, some clash between fishing vessels or um, oil prospecting ships or whatever, um, you know, could end up you know, escalating, bringing in navies, bringing in other navies, and all the rest of it, which could potentially lead to a massive confrontation between China and the US. Um, which would then inevitably drag in other countries around the region uh, into, and potentially even including the UK. So I shall leave it there. Um, happy to take any questions. How long do we have, Adrian, or are we <clears throat> out of time? Ten minutes, Ten minutes or so. Um, very happy to take some questions on kind of aspects of the South China Sea um, disputes um, or kind of what this means for sort of US-China relations or the, the bigger picture as well. Um, what it's like, how exactly is the UN reacting to the world? Right. Well, the UN is, is you know, is 
is the sum of its parts. Yeah. So, um, you know, the 180 odd or whatever members of the United Nations, but the, you know, the five that really count, the permanent five members of the Security Council, UK, US, France, uh, China and, and Russia. Um, and of course, those, each of those five countries has a veto. Um, so nothing will get through the Security Council if any one of those countries chooses to veto it. So therefore, you know, China is not going to vote for a motion that's critical of China uh, and Russia will probably support them. So, but that's not to say that UN institutions are doing nothing. So, um, for example, a lot of this, uh, the, the latest round of disputes began when something called the UN Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, very important organization, um, started to collect claims that each of the countries were making under the Law of the Sea Convention, under UNCLOS. Um, and because all the states agreed that they would all submit their claims to the UN, and then the, you know, there would then be some kind of process that would sort of try and sort out the claims, that then became a place, you know, where these disputes could be aired, could become public, if you like. Um, so things that were latent, that were sort of under the under the radar, if you like, surfaced through this process. So really, that's what the UN should be doing. It should be kind of, you know, taking these claims and resolving them. Um, the question is whether uh, countries are willing to have an outside adjudicator rule on their claims. Now, some of the um, countries in the region uh, have been willing to do that. So, um, so for example, um, in um, back in uh, the, or the the nineties, the um, Singapore, sorry, to begin with, Malaysia, Indonesia sent a couple of their claims uh, to um, uh, to dispute resolution. So they had um, a couple of islands down here on the Malaysian Indonesia boundary down here, um, which they were willing to send to the International Court of Justice, which then ruled on which companies are life alone. Them. And then, sorry, let's talk about the bottom map. There's a couple of rocks between Singapore and Malaysia down here, which they, they also sent to an International Court of Justice, um, which then ruled in that case, in favour of Singapore. Um, so there have been processes of actually sorting out some of this stuff, but the problem is none of the countries concerned are willing uh, to send the same um, kinds of issues uh, to the International Court of Justice or any other body um, uh, over the South China Sea. Uh, the Philippines initiated a court, well, not in my court, a, a tribunal process um, but it wasn't about who owned the beaches, it was about who had the rights to the oil and gas. There was a maritime dispute back in 2013 and that was in 16. And the Philippines won that hands down, but China has refused to accept the ruling. So that's where a lot of the current uh, issues begin from. Any other yeah. Hi. questions, please? Uh, do you think that the Chinese Navy and Air Force are capable of need to push around countries that you even even with more likely to support and need to be a way of calming these tensions. Yeah, I mean China's navy is growing or has grown rapidly. At the time you know, the last year before, it was adding the equivalent tonnage to the navy each year of the entire world navy. Yeah. So you know that's a lot of ships. Um, uh, aircraft carriers, uh, submarines, and uh, smaller vessels. They're still very capable. Um, so, yes, China's navy is perfectly capable of squashing the navies of every other um, you know, country around the region. Um, but you've got Japan just out of shot at the top right there, then you've got the US, um, who are you know, may have similarly sized navies. What we don't know, of course, is, you know, when push comes to shove, you know, who would prevail in a war? Um, and we're in this kind of different, in this difficult period, really, of history when, you know, up until, say, 10, 15 years ago, it was clear that the US would win any kind of confrontation. Yeah. But now China's got to this point where, you know, there's a kind of, there's at least an area of doubt in the minds on both sides, really, you know, who would win? You know, so is it therefore worth having a, a crack, you know, pushing further because you think the other side will 
you know, blink first and back down? Um, or do you think that somehow you've got some technology which will be better than their technology? And the other side thinks that they've got some technology which is better than the technology that you think is better. Um, and so we're in this very difficult situation where potentially both sides think they might win a confrontation, which then leads them into a whole line of thinking about whether it's actually worth pushing this forward and taking the risk. Um, and you know, from someone on the American side who sort of think, well, China's getting stronger and relatively we're not, do they think, well, you know, should we do it now? Because you know, it's going to get worse for us in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, do we provoke a confrontation in the South China Sea or over Taiwan, potentially? You know, this is the sort of maybe some of the thinking that goes on behind the scenes in the Pentagon or the Chinese equivalent, um, you know, thinking about military planning ahead. So, you know, uh, and of course, the other thing is that the Chinese haven't fought um, a naval battle since um, they fought the Vietnamese down here in 1988. Um, so nobody knows whether the Chinese Navy would actually work in wartime or whether it would, uh, it's an experience um, would mean it was rapidly defeated. So no one really knows. Um, and frankly, nobody wants to find out. Uh, so you kind of end up with this sort of, uh, this sort of cockpit of confrontation down here, which comes to the surface every now and then, you know, with Taiwan or over these islands or uh, with Japan or, uh, you know, potentially a scenario involving uh, North Korea or, or, you know, another one that spills over. Um, and everybody knows what's at stake. Everyone's trying to make sure it doesn't happen, but at the same time, they're all trying to appear with strong resolve and strong force to try to encourage the other side to back down um, and not push it to the ultimate level of a confrontation. Yes. Yeah. A good point. Well, so um, it's about physical occupation. Yeah. So some of the islands are physically occupied um, and uh, some of them uh, are not. So um, this, you know, the Scarborough Shelf is not occupied, um, but the Philippines and China are both sort of, you know, intending around it, if you like. Whereas uh, Swallow Reef, this one has now got a, a, a runway and even a diving resort, you can go and visit it, built on top of it. So sort of Malaysians have stuck their flag in it. And then you can see the Chinese um, started with very small features on theirs, which then became much larger. So the sort of the most difficult time uh, on this was, uh, was um, in the 1970s. Uh, so, uh, the very end of the Vietnam War, when southern Vietnam still existed, um, uh, it claimed the Paris Islands and occupied half of them, and China occupied the other half that time. Um, and in 1974, there was a, a brief uh, sort of couple of day battle war uh, between the navies of the two sides, and China occupied uh, the eastern side of Paris Island, um, and just and, and took them. Um, and in 1988, there was a confrontation. Uh, between China and what was then communist Vietnam after the end of the Vietnam War um, uh, over a uh, place called Johnson Reef there, which, in which 64 Vietnamese Marines were killed. So those have been the only violent confrontations uh, in terms of, you know, bullets and, and people dying. Um, but, you know, you had a lot of sort of jockeying, ships bashing into each other, that kind of thing. In general, all the country's concerns have respected the presence of the other states. So they haven't really ever tried to evict them apart from those two uh, instances that I mentioned. So uh, the, the very first picture I showed you with the um, uh, the water cannon incident, um, this uh, is taking place around Scarborough Shoal, which is unoccupied, but there's also uh, another feature called the second Thomas Shoal, there's obviously the first Thomas Shoal nearby, the second Thomas Shoal. Um, and in 1999, the Philippines was concerned that China was thinking of occupying this feature. So it took uh, an old ship, uh, actually a Second World War ship that the Americans had given it uh, many years before, and it rammed it, rammed this ship 
onto this reef. Um, and it's had a little outpost of five or six Philippine Marines living on this ship. Obviously, they've changed the actual Marines in that time um, to claim it. Um, and the ship is literally rusting apart. You know, it's kind of, it's very dangerous to live on. You know, it's, you know, being whatever, 25 years, you know, at sea without being painted, it's falling apart. Um, and the Philippines are trying to sort of restore this ship, you know, shore it up, stop it, you know, completely decaying. Because they think that if these five Marines leave, then about 30 minutes later, Chinese forces will land on the same feature and occupy it permanently. But China could easily, given it's the size of its navy and all the rest of it, could easily, you know, push them off, you know, shoot them all, bomb them up, you know, blow them up or whatever. But it chooses not to because it doesn't want to be seen as that kind of space that pushes people around. It likes to do the pushing around, but in a way that kind of is below the level of actual outright military confrontation, hostility, so water cannon or bumping into ships, that kind of thing. So at the moment, the states generally respect the occupations of the other in practice, if not in law. So they don't say, yes, we think you're right and that this piece of land belongs to you, but they don't want to do anything that kind of steps up the confrontation to the point of actual bullets and conflict. Bill, thank you very much. Um, I think we better call a halt there before the questions get even harder. <laughs> um, but thank you very much indeed. We've got a, a break now and then as I said, if you can sort out where you want to go for your language tutorials, Hannah will be out there to sort of direct people to the first floor for Arabic and Vietnamese and everybody else back for Arabic language. Thank you very much.